And uh, thank you all for coming on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to this uh, wonderful space here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, this particular era of uh, architecture and design, so uh, I was extra nice to be able to uh, come speak at the, at the Nutra House um, and to learn more about the Ethical uh, uh, Culture Society, which uh, is, is wonderful uh, to, um, to know about. And, um, and I, I am looking forward to a conversation um, that will merge uh, the ethical uh, theories that I'm going to be uh, grounding my remarks in and the sort of practical considerations uh, that emerging technologies are confronting us with. Uh, and that's uh, the kind of uh, philosophy and the kind of ethics uh, that, I, that I like to do, the kind that actually thinks about the choices that are confronting us today and how uh, ethical insights uh, and deeper understanding of, uh, of ethical life can inform those choices. So, uh, just a little background about me very quickly. I uh, grew up a massive nerd, uh, as, uh, uh, as many do, and um, my, my first world-shaking experience was going to see Star Wars in 1977, um, seeing that sort of opening shot of the destroyer sort of coming overhead and the sense of scale that just blows your mind. Uh, and then a few minutes later, uh, uh, watching uh, a young woman um, blasting her way around with, uh, uh, with a blaster and intimidating Darth Vader. So, uh, so in many respects, this was a formative, uh, formative uh, uh, experience for a young woman. And I spent the rest of my life um, uh, basically thinking about how I could uh, embed my love of technology in a career. But I never uh, really uh, thought that my talents uh, were on the technical side. Uh, my parents were convinced growing up I was going to be a lawyer, because all I did was argue with them. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't know that being a philosopher was a thing you could actually do instead, uh, that you would use the same skill. Um, but uh, I chose philosophy uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, certainly uh, the fact that it allowed me to ask ethical questions. Uh, and it was very fortunate that I was able to study the philosophy of science and philosophy of technology uh, at a time when the ethical implications of these things uh, were exploding in front of us. Uh, and it was my students who really, around 2006, started pushing me to talk more about the ethical implications uh, of these new developments because they were feeling uh, this disorientation uh, from, at first, the way that social media and smartphones were changing their experiences and their relationships, um, and, and very quickly, uh, they began to realize that the entire ground of our social, political, uh, economic, and physical circumstances was shifting underneath them, um, and that the kinds of values uh, that uh, they had expected to guide them in their lives uh, were no longer uh, clearly evident in the sorts of institutional changes that were happening. And they didn't know how to rediscover uh, a sort of ethical guidance and a, uh, and a value system that made sense in this new world. Uh, and the fact is, is that um, uh, my students from 10 years ago, my students today, are realizing that they have to rebuild that ethical guidance system for themselves. The, uh, the generations that came before uh, didn't preserve it for them uh, and, and didn't anticipate the changes that would make it hard for that value system to carry forward. Uh, into the 21st century. And so um, the work that I do is mostly about trying to give my students and, and uh, that generation the courage uh, to construct a new kind of ethical framework to move forward in. Um, and the book that I wrote, uh, Technology and the Virtues, uh, a Philosophical Guide to a Future Worth Wanting, um, which I published last year, was really about thinking about what that kind of new framework uh, might need to look like. Uh, but this work uh, is uh, part of a more recent project, um, and my next book, uh, which is going to be called The AI Mirror, um, Rebuilding Humanity in an Age of Machine Thinking. Uh, and it's really about uh, the ways in which um, emerging technologies are uh, not just literally uh, creating the prospect of machine thinking, um, but in a more figurative sense, um, gradually um, enculturating us into machine thinking. And this is a, a development that isn't brand new. Uh, it has been around, actually, 
uh, since uh, pre-modern uh, uh, times, the attempt to uh, streamline human thinking, uh, to mechanize it, uh, to, to make it serve uh, other interests than, it, than its own, um, and to drive it into more predictable and controllable patterns. But the emergence of artificial intelligence uh, has breathed new life into this particular dream or uh, nightmare, uh, depending on how you look at it. Um, the prospect of actually merging uh, machine thinking uh, with uh, human cognition is now, is now real and uh, materializing in front of us. So this talk uh, tries to think through some of the implications of that. Um, and the first half of it is going to be um, uh, an, uh, kind of philosophical. So first I'll just give you an overview of the, of the scope of my talk. Uh, this section will talk about a concept in philosophy uh, called the space of moral reasons. And I'll try to explain why I think it's an important uh, concept to, to think about. Um, there will be a little bridge between the second and third sections uh, through science fiction. Um, again, massive nerd, but also uh, science fiction often is the bridge uh, between uh, the present and our imagination of the future. Uh, and in this case, it'll actually a be a bridge into the past uh, through Isaac Asimov and looking at what uh, 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 60 years ago he thought we would be uh, doing with our lives today um, and uh, some of the implications that it has for our future. Uh, and then finally, some practical thinking about uh, constructive steps forward uh, that we might take in the design and development of artificial intelligence uh, to try to mitigate some of the harms and threats uh, that I'll be identifying in, in my talk. Okay. So, first half will be more philosophical, second half will be more applied, but hopefully it'll all fit together. Okay, so, um, much of today's media obsession with artificial intelligence and the power of algorithms obscures the fact that algorithms, as finite series of steps for generating solutions to given cognitive problems, are nothing new to human society. Both the term algorithm, uh, which its root first appears in, in late medieval Latin, um, uh, named for a 9th century mathematician, and its reference class, which includes the earliest mathematical procedures for counting, addition, and division, uh, long predate modern computing practices. Okay? So the concept of an algorithm is not a 21st century concept. It's not even a 20th century. It's, uh, uh, far uh, older than that. Yet modern computing has invested today's digital algorithms, especially those embedded in AI-driven and automated decision support systems, with vastly expanded social power. Today, increasingly sophisticated algorithms constrain and shape what we read, what we watch and hear online, who we are invited to meet or date, what medical treatments we're advised to undergo, who will hire us, how the justice system will treat us, and where we're allowed to live. Further social constraints and influences from AI and decision system algorithms are projected in almost every sphere of culture, governance, and commercial activity. Since new mechanisms of social power are always philosophically significant, we should not be surprised that these developments raise a host of important political, epistemological, and ethical questions. Among them are questions about the opacity of the social mechanisms uh, dependent on these new uh, computing techniques. Uh, how, many have, uh, how many of you are familiar with the concept of a black box? Um, okay, uh, a black box meaning something that uh, is opaque, uh, where there's something going on inside uh, that we can't see or understand. And uh, the metaphor of the black box uh, has been uh, increasingly used to describe artificial intelligence. Uh, because it has become increasingly challenging to understand exactly when, how, or by whose authority uh, the algorithms driving AI and uh, related systems affect their profound influences on our lives. This lack of transparency in a black box society, to borrow the title of Frank Pasquale's uh, 2015 excellent book on this subject, raises profound ethical questions about justice, power, inequality, bias, freedom, and democratic values in an AI-driven world. Okay. 
So uh, we could talk all day about uh, the problems of a black box society uh, from uh, the lens of, uh, of ethics. And we could give a talk uh, on any of these topics uh, and um, have uh, many considerations to explore. The problem is especially complex uh, because it doesn't have a single cause. So when we talk about uh, black boxes uh, in the technology sector, um, we often think about uh, the ways in which proprietary technology uh, prevent us from uh, understanding what's going on because we're literally uh, prohibited from accessing uh, the design or the algorithm. Uh, but we also have a lot of opacity that comes from um, the problem of poorly curated, or poorly labeled, uh, opaque uh, data sets, right? So uh, all of these <laughs> systems uh, that we call AI, uh, and I should add that a lot of the systems I'm going to talk about in the second half of the talk aren't really AI at all. And in fact, there's a big debate among computer scientists and technologists about whether we're even using the word AI uh, uh, legitimately um, in, in any sense, uh, whether even the more powerful um, systems like AlphaGo really deserve uh, to be called artificially intelligent. Uh, we can talk about that debate in the, uh, in the Q&A uh, period. Um, but I want to just stipulate that there are these questions about whether AI is an appropriate term to be using for the technologies we have today and the technologies we're going to have for the near future. Uh, but since we are using those terms already, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and refer to AI. Just understand that I'm not making any claims about whether these systems are really intelligent. In fact, I think it's clear that we have good reasons to be skeptical about that. Uh, so when I talk about AI, what I really mean is um, in intensely uh, data-driven uh, uh, computing systems that perform tasks that formerly required human intelligence to perform or analyze. Um, so that's really all I mean. It's, pretty, it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, but the, the data uh, can themselves be causes of opacity, uh, because rarely do we uh, fully understand uh, where the data come, came from, uh, how uh, uh, reliable it is, um, or uh, what uh, features of the world it necessarily represents. Um, there's also some other forms of opacity we don't talk a lot about, but the uh, research that I've done suggests that this is an even greater, uh, perhaps, cause of, of opacity, is a bureaucratic apathy and failure in the use of uh, data-driven uh, decision systems, um, and a failure uh, of the people implementing these systems to actually look uh, at uh, what they're doing, to actually study, audit, validate the system or its results, uh, or even to understand uh, what the systems are and what they're doing. And I'll give some examples of that in the second half of the talk. Um, the uh, kind of black box problem that we're more familiar with uh, in the media is this idea that uh, the machines themselves are intrinsically opaque. The AI is somehow um, an enigma wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in a, in a riddle, because the way that uh, these systems are built doesn't mirror uh, the, the human uh, thought process at all. Uh, and so the gaps between human cognition and machine cognition uh, are vast. Uh, not because they are more intelligent than we are, but because they're simply uh, not analogs of human intelligence at all. Uh, they're a completely different kind of system. And this gets uh, sometimes um, hard to understand when you hear all this talk about neural networks and the ways that new uh, AI systems are modeled on, uh, on the human brain. Um, but we can talk about this more in the Q&A if, if it's important, but uh, that conceals a lot of dissimilarities between uh, artificial intelligence and the human brain, and the, the neural net metaphor doesn't actually take us very far. Um, so in fact, these, these gaps are very real. Uh, and this uh, is related to the problem of inscrutability or um, uh, unpredictability, especially in machine learning and deep uh, uh, learning uh, applications. Uh, the idea that even the designers of, uh, for example, deep learning algorithms often don't know why the system is uh, uh, coming up with a particular result. Uh, they just know that on a sort of statistical level it's working uh, or producing acceptable uh, uh, results, but they don't know in any particular case uh, how the uh, machine arrives at its decision or how it can be explained. Okay, 
Um, so we can come back to these forms of opacity uh, later if, uh, if necessary. But my focus today is an aspect of the transparency problem that's not yet been widely discussed among philosophers and other academics or in media and public policy circles. So all of these kinds of things are being talked about, which is great, and we need to talk about it more because these aspects of uh, uh, machine opacity are very important and, and present great risks. But this talk is going to focus on a risk that n no one is really addressing right now, um, that, I, that I think is uh, uh, a, a quite significant one. And this is the prospect that the growing opacity of AI systems and their uses may result in a severe and ethically troubling contraction of what philosophers have called the space of moral reasons. Okay, so what's that? Uh, many philosophers have presupposed that within the domain of ethical practice, there is a space of moral reasons in which moral agents are invited to act. This space may be understood in several ways. Uh, it might be seen uh, as a cognitive space in which a moral agent enjoys the psychological freedom to reflect upon morally salient facts, values, possibilities, principles, consequences, and ideals that might inform and motivate his or her actions. Okay. So if you think about the last time uh, that you uh, took uh, a moment to think really hard about a, a moral problem in your own life or a moral issue in society, and you started uh, sort of exploring the different principles, uh, the different values, uh, the different consequences uh, that, that you think about when you think about ethics. And everyone in this room uh, is here, presumably, because they have some interest in, in this kind of question. When you're doing that, you are in the space of moral reasons from a cognitive standpoint. Okay? You're exploring that space, you're activating that space. But there's another way of thinking about the space of moral reasons, and that's to think about it as a public space. Um, a space in which morally salient facts, values, possibilities, principles, consequences, ideals, etc. can be entered into a moral discourse. One that can inform and motivate the decisions of moral agents within a given community of actors. So, when the Ethical Culture Society of Silicon Valley meets and has discussions together, um, the community of the society is in fact in the space of moral reasons, in this public way, right? Um, and when we have debates uh, uh, on Twitter about moral issues even, we're in the public space of moral reasons, although uh, perhaps in a somewhat attenuated way. Uh, but um, what I want to emphasize is these two things aren't uh, radically distinct, right? In order to be in the public space of moral reasons, one has to activate the cognitive space in some way um, in order to contribute meaningfully. Uh, and likewise, to be in the cognitive space is also to understand the public and social meaning of, of ethics. Uh, so one can fuse the psychological and public conceptions and see them as mutually constitutive elements of the context within which moral agents are enabled to choose and act. So I'll say a little bit more about that in the, in the next section of the talk, but let's, let's, this is still the introduction. In all of these formulations, the metaphor of space is intended to represent a temporally and discursively open, yet structured, horizon of moral thinking and choosing that allows an agent to do several things. First, to assume responsibility for his or her moral action. Second, to be potentially responsive to moral reasons communicated by other moral agents or to other new moral information in the agent's environment. And third, to be capable of morally justifying her actions to herself and others. I'll go through those later. Preserving the space of moral reasons has also been characterized as an essential way of being at home in the moral world, a way of seeing moral phenomena as an inextricably meaningful feature of one's life and the life of others. So some people feel at home with the concept of ethics and morality. It's something uh, that they already see as central to the way they live their lives. Uh, and to others, this concept is uh, somewhat distant or remote or alien. Uh, it's something that they don't know how to grapple with or incorporate uh, into their thinking. Uh, so being in the space of moral reasons is also a way of being at home with moral thinking. Historically, the threats to the space of moral reasons uh, have been uh, considerable and diverse. They've ranged from authoritarian ideologies that encourage us to leave the task of moral thinking to our God or our leaders, 
all too often presented as a package deal, to cynical, jaded philosophies in which moral thinking is seen as mere politics by other means, or perhaps the wasted effort of the hopelessly naive. Fortunately, history also contains in its pantheon of great souls, philosophers, theologians, activists, artists, and many others, voices of resistance to these threats. Philosophers might cite the golden age of Athens and Rome, the Enlightenment era in Europe, uh, perhaps the civil rights era in the United States, as times in which the space of moral reasons had to be defended and held open. But there are many more stories of resistance to be told. Today, we face a new threat to the space of moral reasons and a need for a new resistance. After first unpacking the concept of the space of moral reasons a bit further, I'm going to review several ways in which the space of moral reasons is at risk of shrinking, both cognitively and in public life, as a result of our growing reliance on increasingly opaque machine decisions. The risks of such reliance include shrinking public and cognitive spaces for reflection upon our actions and their moral status, shrinking space for moral appeals of the rightness, goodness, or appropriateness of AI-generated judgments, shrinking space for moral attribution of responsibility for such judgments and their consequences, and shrinking space for the use of moral imagination in considering and weighing alternative patterns of moral reasoning and judgment. So in the second half of the talk, I'll illustrate each of these types of contraction uh, and give examples of this uh, in uh, AI-driven decision systems used in jurisprudence, human resources, and law enforcement, where such use to affect or mediate human decisions of moral consequence may already be seen. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I close by asking how more ethically informed design and use of AI decision support systems might allow us to hold open the space of moral reasons, or even help us to enlarge that space in personal and public decision practices. Okay, so that covers everything that we're going to do. So what is the space of moral reasons and why should we care about it? We've already said that it has both a cognitive and a public dimension. To unpack these dimensions, we must first understand that the space of moral reasons is, of course, a metaphor. While a moral person's moral reasoning does take place within a well-defined physical space, i.e. in his or her spatially extended brain, and public moral reasoning takes place in physical and virtual spaces of its own, these are not the kinds of space we're referring to. Using the spatial notion of extension as a metaphorical bridge, we can understand moral reasoning as a process that's extended in at least two other ways, temporal and discursive. The temporal extension of moral reasoning is easy to grasp. It takes a duration of time for a human to reason about anything, but moral reasoning in particular is time dependent. First, consider those theories of moral psychology that emphasize two distinct timescales and associated cognitive mechanisms for moral decision making. The fast mechanisms of moral analysis, as posited uh, by scholars like Jonathan Haidt and Daniel Kahneman, are said to be driven not by explicit reasoning, but by emotionally laden social intuitions, think about sort of gut reactions, right, that produce rapid and motivationally compelling moral judgments. The slow mechanisms of moral analysis, on the other hand, are cognitively higher order and more explicit, but often motivationally weaker processes of conscious moral reasoning that allow for careful considerations of strength of evidence, logical coherence of argument, and consistency with norms or ideals to which one is explicitly committed. Okay, so clearly the latter kind of moral reasoning takes more time. We need not delve here into the ongoing scholarly controversies about the merits or fine-grained implications of this model of moral decision-making, the fast versus slow system one, system two division. Uh, I'm not committed to saying that this is in fact the right way to understand moral decision-making. Because even its defenders, like Haidt and Kahneman, who are often justly criticized for giving the personal and social force of moral reasoning far too little credit, even they acknowledge that explicit or slow moral reasoning is important and essential for a healthy society. As Haidt has acknowledged in a debate with his critics, quote, reasons matter, reasons produce movement in social mores. Even if he continues to insist that the emotional ground of the debate must first be cleared of opposing fast intuitions, if this moral movement is to happen. Moreover, he celebrates the norms of, quote, reason giving and responsiveness to reasons, end quote, that define slow moral reasoning processes. As he says, I wish such norms could be sprinkled into the water supply in Washington. <laughs> okay. So um, even if you think that most of our moral decisions are not uh, particularly rational, 
uh, that they're mostly emotional uh, and unreflective, uh, you still may think that uh, moral reasoning is something important that we ought to uh, get better at and do more of. Uh, I happen to think, by the way, that uh, there are some flaws in, in Haydn and Kahneman's analysis, that moral reasoning and emotion are not split off or hived off from one another, that in fact uh, moral reasoning is uh, also uh, uh, emotionally grounded, uh, and, and that that's uh, in fact uh, part of what makes moral reasoning uh, work. Um, so I don't think that these are separate systems, uh, uh, although I do think that they operate on different, uh, in different ways and at different timescales. So moral reasoning of the type that observes the norms of evidence sensitivity, logical coherence, logical consistency, reason giving and reason responsiveness, that kind of moral reasoning takes time. Both clock time, because it happens more slowly in the brain than does moral intuition, and experienced time. It requires that we perceive ourselves as having an open horizon of time to think things through, to contemplate, to ruminate, to weigh, uh, to locate, to inspect and trace the relevant connections. Imagine yourself deciding to actually sit down and really think hard about a profound moral problem in society or in your own personal life, and one that doesn't have an obvious answer. Then imagine someone setting a running timer on the table. It doesn't really matter, right, if the timer has five minutes on it, or 15, or 30. You might have only needed five minutes to reach a sound conclusion, but your perception of a closed and inflexible temporal horizon will disturb and confound uh, the reasoning process anyway. Right? So space of moral reasons has to be temporally open. That horizon has to be held open. This temporally extended horizon intersects with another discursively extended one. Of course, there's the trivial fact that the temporal space of moral reasons is increased during moral discourse with other persons or groups because I have to wait for my reasons and evidence to be considered by others, for my objections to be answered, for my interlocutors to articulate their own reasoning, evidence, and objections. Yet even when moral reasoning is done by an individual sitting alone, it remains a socially mediated discursive process. For the reasons that we are drawn to consider when we reflect ethically, insofar as they concern moral life, that is life with others, always have a social context. The language of moral thought thus always projects social, political, cultural, and epistemological distance between my reasons and those of others. So this horizon, this discursive horizon, is about the distance between my moral thinking and the thinking of others. To reason rightly about moral matters, I must conceptualize and remain acutely cognizant of the spaces between what I have, what I know, believe, need, want, and feel, and the often very different things that are had, known, believed, needed, wanted, and felt by the other humans involved in the moral situation in, that I am reasoning about. This is why narcissists are generally terrible moral reasoners. Huh. They cannot readily perceive such spaces and discontinuities between themselves and others, or grasp their importance. Right? So for the narcissist, the space of moral reasons is like this wide. Right? It's, it's, it's my moral uh, priorities, and my values, uh, my wants, my needs, and everyone else is folded into that and represented within that. Um, so sound moral reasoning is that more uh, expansive consideration of the space of moral reasons. The space of moral reasons, then, is a temporally and discursively extended space in which moral thinking can, so to speak, stretch out and do its work, both in the psychological and the public context, which are always conjoined at some level. Preserving a sense of myself as a moral being requires this space to be held open. For otherwise, I might act morally if my fast processes of moral intuition are sufficiently reliable. But I will not have consciously assigned these decisions or actions a place in the moral narrative that anchors this sense of myself as a moral being, a creature who confronts morally significant things in the world and makes deliberate efforts to respond to them in moral ways. Okay. So even if I'm not needing uh, moral reasoning in order to make the correct decision. If I'm not comfortable in the space of moral reasons, those decisions won't be integrated into my own sense of myself and uh, my life as morally meaningful. They will remain sort of unconscious and 
and not integrated in my own <coughs> self-representation. For a virtue ethicist like me, it's obvious that preserving space for more reasons, both cognitively and publicly, is, is an essential prerequisite for the cultivation of practical wisdom, what Aristotle called phronesis. And it's a critical component of moral self-cultivation in general. One doesn't develop oneself as a moral being without uh, this sort of explicit um, uh, working in the space of moral reasons. The holistic understanding of the field of moral community and one's particular place in it that Aristotle, Confucius, the Buddha all saw as required for ethical virtue cannot be obtained without sustained opportunities to practice stretching out one's mind and speech with others in the space of moral reasons. This space also enables essential features of moral functioning in society. First, it allows an agent to assume responsibility for his or her moral actions and for others to confidently attribute responsibility to her. Right? Because once it's part of our personal narrative, we're able to take ownership of it. There is, of course, a kind of moral responsibility that we attribute to a person who's voluntarily done something wrong, but cannot, even in retrospect, say how he or she arrived at that decision. Still, there is a hollowness at the core of that kind of responsibility that disturbs us. See every police procedural ever, where the detective presses the perp who has just confessed with an insistent, but why did you do it? Right? We're not satisfied uh, with the kind of moral responsibility uh, that doesn't have any uh, articulable structure within the space of moral reasons. The space of moral reasons also allows us to be potentially responsive to moral reasons communicated by other moral agents or to other new moral information in the agent's environment. As long as the process remains extended, there is time for new or revised moral information to be entered at any stage, allowing us to back up and make the necessary adjustments to our assumptions, values, and inferences. Even an extended moral judgment that has been concluded can be revisited, retraced, and modified with hindsight, just as I can retrace the steps of a hike I made yesterday and take an improvised detour. Or, as Hyde Kahneman and others know is often, often the case, I might make a moral decision on the basis of raw, reactive intuition, but I can take that decision and then use moral reasoning to expand it after the fact, to give it the extension and volume it originally lacked. In many cases, I might do this simply to inf invent a convincing fiction, to assure myself or others that I had good, well-considered reasons for what I did. Right. So this is the case where we look for the reasons after the fact, and they, they may not be, in fact, related to my actual motivations. They're just a good story uh, to justify what I've done. But that kind of, uh, uh, after the fact, uh, moral reasoning can be done with sincere remedial intent. It can be used to give a quick emotional decision a careful moral audit when time allows, allowing me post hoc insight into the ways in which my raw moral intuitions serve me and others well or poorly. Right? So a lot of our moral reasoning is about looking at decisions we've made and uh, trying to be more honest about uh, the reasons that drove them, and perhaps the reasons that should have uh, driven us, but didn't. Finally, and related to the previous observation, the space of moral reasons allows me to morally justify my actions to myself and others. Perhaps even more importantly, it allows others the reasonable expectation that they may demand such justification from me. If I've not been allowed the space to think about what I do in the moral realm, or what my society does, then I cannot offer any reliable evidence that I or my society should have done it, or should continue to do it. If most others in my society are equally foreclosed from the space of moral reasons, then both I and my fellows are left at the mercy of moral luck, if we are to hope to have any, uh, if we are to have any hope of a good life together. And in general, we are ill-advised to leave our fortunes to luck, if we have any reasonable means of steering them well. Okay. Now, to the bridge. In the 1955 short story franchise by Isaac Asimov, by the way, anyone here remember this story or have read it? Okay, only a couple. I, I love that this is a, a sort of a, a minor gem of Asimov's that uh, a lot of people uh, haven't read or, or, or don't recall. So in this story, uh, we meet Norman Muller, 
an office drone with a clerky soul, love that phrase, who in the story's imagining of the year 2008, okay, so, uh, <laughs> uh, is selected, so Norman is selected by Multivac, the artificially intelligent arbiter of American democracy. Uh -oh. Uh -huh, yep. <laughs> to represent the electorate in choosing the next president of the United States. 2008. By means of an impressive body of calculations, opaque even to multivax human handlers, the supercomputer has determined that in this particular year of 2008, it is the very ordinary mind of Mr. Norman Muller of Bloomington, Indiana, that can provide it the best window into the collective will of the American electorate. As multivax system administrator John Paulson perfunctorily explains, by interviewing Muller, multivax will be able to declare with great mathematical precision the winning presidential candidate, just as multivac declares with unassailable predictive accuracy the result of all elections, national, state, and local. And of course, given multivac's predictive power, Paulson tells us, the elections aren't the only thing it's used for. Yet Mueller's role in the election is not to express to multivac his own personal judgment of who ought to be president. Right? That wouldn't be democracy. That would just be the rule of one. <coughs> Rather, by posing to Mueller a series of seemingly arbitrary questions about matters as banal as the price of eggs, while monitoring Mueller's biometric data alongside his answers, Multivac is able to calculate from the interview certain imponderable attitudes of the mind <coughs> characteristic of the American voter at that precise historical moment. Mm -hmm. Knowledge of these imponderable attitudes, when combined with the trillions of other pieces of data known to Multivac, Right, so it's not just the interview with Norman, it's everything else that has been, all the other data that has been fed into Multivac about what's going on in America at that time. That massive pool of data allows it to compute with great accuracy what the total vote count of the American electorate would be were the election held by the old analog means, which it won't be. <laughs> in the story, we're not given any express reason to question Multivac's predictive powers or its security from tampering or corruption. Still, the system administrator repeatedly emphasizes to Mueller their shared civic duty to maintain secrecy about the details of the process, so that the workings, especially the human parts, are insulated from, quote unquote, outside pressures. Pretty sure that meant Russians in 1955. Guess it still does. <laughs> Things never change. Multivac, then, is part of an algorithmic decision system that involves many human technicians and administrators, and human inputs like Mueller, yet which is massively opaque. This opacity is reinforced on multiple <clears throat> levels. First, the computational power and knowledge base of Multivac simply exceed the grasp of human thought by an immense magnitude. Second, the system architecture and internal logic of Multivax AI is not isomorphic to human reasoning. After all, by what inferences would you discover the imponderable attitudes and minutia of the American political mindset by asking somebody what they think about the price of eggs? Or whether they favor central incinerators, which is another question that Norman gets. Nor are the scales of judgment comparable. Multivac performs a statistical analysis of correlations within a massive pool of data about virtually all known facts. Whereas human voters are, by nature of our cognitive limitations, far narrower in our knowledge and reasoning. Finally, the overarching algorithm decision system of which Multivax algorithm is a central part, right? So Multivax algorithm is just part of a bigger algorithm, right? This bigger process and operation. And the whole thing is largely obscured from public view. American voters know that Multivac calculates the election results on the basis of an interview with a single representative individual. But the details of how Multivac conducts the interview and how the results are calculated, to the limited extent that these are understood by Multivac's human architects, are, highly, uh, are, are tightly kept secrets of the national security infrastructure. Okay. So we, we see that its operators had only a vague notion of the general plan of relays and circuits that had long since grown past the point where any single human could possibly have a firm grasp of the whole. Multivac was self-adjusting and self-correcting. It had to be, for nothing human could adjust and correct it quickly enough or even adequately enough. So they, the humans, attended the monstrous giant only lightly 
and superficially, yet as well as any men could. So basically, in 1955, Asimov is already projecting the future of deep learning, machine opacity, black boxes, right, that are too big, too complex, and uh, operate too quickly for human control and intervention. As well as Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Right, I'm getting to that. <laughs> Eight years after the date of Asimov's projection, American elections are still carried out by individual voters, albeit with the help of Russian hackers and Macedonian teenagers cranking up political fiction and fake news farms. <laughs> Yet each of the forms of opacity that Asimov envisioned in franchise in 1955 exists in AI-driven decision support systems in wide use today. Most critically, those computational systems dependent upon deep learning and unsupervised learning machine algorithms, which pose special difficulties for reliable human interpretation, validation, and auditing. AI decision support systems today, just as in Multivac, are used for lots of things. To identify terrorist threats and targets in voice, image, email, social media, and SMS data. To assign risk scores to defendants in bail, sentencing, and parole evaluations. To determine where and when law enforcement personnel are most likely to encounter certain crimes. Or to diagnose cancers and recommend personalized treatment plans. Other systems calculate how likely you are to fit into the corporate culture and remain with the company to which you have applied, how close a match a stranger is to your romantic preferences, how likely you are to repay the business loan you're seeking, or the chances that your kid will thrive at the selective private school you aspire for her to attend. These are the sorts of decisions that govern how well or how poorly our lives go. Yet in none of these systems can the average user or in many cases, even the system regulators, programmers, and administrators grasp precisely how the decision process is being carried out or what salient factors are driving the results. In the franchise story, we are led to question how the political franchise of the voter can possibly be preserved under such conditions of algorithmic opacity. But we must notice that one of the most disturbing aspects of the franchise scenario and our present reality is the contraction in the space of normative ethical reasoning that it fosters, both in the personal and the public domain. Norman Muller has no cause to explicitly think through his own political judgments. First, because he assumes he'll never be the one American chosen to be directly consulted by Multivac. Second, because even when he is, in fact, the one chosen, Multivac does not need to ask him for his personal opinions about politics or his views on the good of the union, much less ask him to account for those opinions with reasons. On the public level, there's a similarly superfluous character to political discourse in the franchise story. It still happens, of course, insofar as polit politicians still campaign and voters still form opinions, but the causal link between explicit public reasoning for those opinions and the final vote, even the political need for explicit public reasoning, is obscure. Do the voters perceive any need to persuade their neighbors or even to account for the reasons behind their own opinions or the signs in their yards? when Multivac can correctly predict everyone's votes by entirely indirect and opaque means. In the story, the background assumption is that Multivac's predictions are, if not perfect, at least as accurate as the tallying of millions of ana analog human votes, and far less costly and cumbersome. The same sort of justification is given for the use of AI decision support systems in human institutions today. <coughs> no one thinks that any computer operating today can actually grasp the moral, legal, or political gravity of drone targeting decisions, sentencing recommendations, loan decisions, anything like that. Much less reason about these things. But if an AI can make decisions that are just as reliable as those made by humans who do reason about them, only faster and more cheaply, then the logic of efficiency invites us to let the reasoning drop out of the process as a now unnecessary human excrescence of analog decision making. What do we lose by giving in to that logic? First, we lose those public and cognitive spaces for reflection upon our actions and moral decisions. Consider the example of predictive policing algorithms, which are increasingly marketed by vendors as using the power of AI to deliver new data-driven insights, that's the new best word, about patterns of criminal activity. The Chicago Police Department currently uses the strategic subject list generated by an algorithm that determines the risk that a particular individual will be a victim or a perpetrator of gun violence. 
Persons who rank high on the list receive a precautionary visit from a police officer and or social worker offering assistance. Now let's set aside legitimate doubts that have been raised about the effectiveness of that algorithm and its use by CPD. The algorithm's lack of transparency remains a grave issue, and not just because these technologies are being used in other cities, such as New Orleans, without public notice or discussion, thanks to back-channel arrangements between the tech companies and agencies that bypass city councils and other elected representatives. Even when the use of the system is not secret, as in Chicago, and there is an opportunity for public debate, it is stifled by the inherent opacity of the algorithms themselves. As ACLU representative Karen Shelley notes, quote, we don't know all the factors that can put someone on the list. And the Chicago Police Department hasn't made public the algorithm that they use. Since the algorithm is proprietary, neither the, public, I'm sorry, neither the police officer nor the social worker making the home visit can know exactly how the person got on the list, nor can they explain the system's reasoning to the person they're visiting. This means that there's no basis for any of them to reflect on the quality or justice of the reason for the interaction. For example, whether it's because a resident has a long criminal history, or just happens to live in a bad neighborhood, which might just mean a poor neighborhood, or lives in a good one but has many police contacts for driving while black. Right? There are all kinds of good reasons and all kinds of terrible reasons why a person might be on this list. But if we don't know their reasons, that space is opaque and uh, unable, uh, inaccessible to us. Were the algorithm transparent and public with clear weightings for each risk factor or combination thereof, then officers using it or members of the public might be invited to reflect upon the relative legitimacy or fairness of those different reasons for intervention. The results might then be shared and debated with relevant parties. Likewise, a more transparent process gives the person receiving the visit a rational basis for reflecting upon its value. Should they welcome it and take it seriously? Should they dismiss it as a nuisance or police harassment? Should they make some life changes? Should they try to get their name removed from the list? How can these possible responses be appropriately evaluated when the opacity of the algorithm tightly constrains the space to reason about their presence on the list? Moreover, the contraction impedes personal or public moral appeals of the rightness, goodness, or appropriateness of these judgments, which is, of course, why institutions seeking to evade criticism have a strong interest in keeping keeping this space closed off. A prime example of this is the use of proprietary algorithms in judicial decisions. As revealed in an investigative series by ProPublica two years ago, at least 10 states in the US, and by now more, employ risk algorithms from companies like North Point. Risk scores for individual defendants are often given directly to judges and parole boards with no transparent analysis of their basis or their limitations. Neither judges nor defendants nor reporters like Angwin have access to the algorithm itself. Sorry, Angwin is the uh, reporter for ProPublica that uh, uh, this, did the story. Nonetheless, the ProPublica team were able to demonstrate that the output of North Point's Compass algorithm shows clear signs of racial bias, falsely predicting black defendants as high-risk reoffenders uh, at almost twice the rate of similar white defendants. The Compass Survey instrument does not inquire about the defendant's racial background, so the bias must come into the analysis in some more complex way. We know this happens uh, in all kinds of uh, machine learning uh, contexts uh, and algorithmic contexts where you don't have race or gender uh, or uh, uh, income as uh, a category in the database, but you have other fields that are correlated with it that uh, the machine uh, picks up on and uh, may uh, uh, result in a uh, bias against uh, the defendants uh, or individuals of, of certain uh, genders, certain uh, racial backgrounds, and certain economic backgrounds, and so on. Further scholarly analysis of the Compass algorithm has suggested that there may be an inevitable design trade-off in these kinds of algorithms between racial parity in false positives and parity in <coughs> true positives. If true, then this is an opportunity for substantive debate about due process, the presumption of innocence, and the particular social harms and costs of false positives that tilt heavily toward defendants of color. But this debate remains closed off, because North Point has refused to share the specifics of its proprietary algorithm that would allow us to confirm the researcher's suspicions about its design limitations. This also hampers the ability of any defendant to present a reasoned argument 
that its use in their particular case introduced bias, while foreclosing the ability of critics to propose and publicly reason with the company about a possible technical fix. The opacity of AI-driven decision systems also impedes the space for moral attribution of responsibility for such decisions and their consequences. Let's go back to the multi-vaccinarian for just a moment and contrast it with the most recent American election. For better or for worse, the moderate transparency of American voting patterns through turnout data, exit polls, local vote totals, voter interviews, and other indicators enables somewhat reasoned, if often chaotic and discordant, public discourse about which social factors, groups, and events were most responsible for the outcome. Debates about the influence of Comey's October surprise, Russian hacking of the DNC, Trump voting white women, disaffected millennials, absentee Obama voters, the disenfranchised working class, white supremacists, and others may not produce immediate social cohesion or reconciliation, but it is important that our clumsy voting algorithm, unlike the fictional multivax, still affords us space for public and private reasoning about the causes and merits of our moral and political choices. Arguably, the lack of consensus in the post-election discourse itself reveals important truths about just how deeply the American political and moral vision has splintered. Contrast this with the highly opaque, until just a few months ago, use of Cambridge Analytica's illegitimately obtained Facebook user data to mount a secretive operation on behalf of the Trump and Brexit campaigns to manipulate voter behavior through algorithmic targeting of our psychological vulnerabilities. This was a calculated campaign of cyber political psyops. Uh, this is a term that uh, the a psychologist working with Cambridge Analytica uh, borrowed from intelligence and military agencies, right? So, um, psychological manipulation uh, through uh, opaque algorithmic means performed on the American electorate. Regardless of the actual impact of the targeting on the US and UK results, uh, for which Cambridge Analytica representatives had openly claimed credit. We now know that Cambridge Analytica's algorithms were loaded with an unprecedented trove of private Facebook user data, including data of users on Winning Friends, which was then deliberately weaponized by well-paid psychologists in an attempt to subvert the function of open civic discourse and to encourage voter detachment from the very powers of explicit reasoning that can produce informed political choices. Of course, the algorithms remain proprietary black boxes, now blocking informed public reasoning about their effects. Did their targeting persuade us, or did it manipulate and deceive us? Those are important distinctions. Did the targeting merely feed our existing political convictions and motivations, or did it distort them? Compare such subversive uses of algorithmic power with the less controversial but equally opaque algorithmic models increasingly used for large-scale corporate and institutional decision-making such as the sort of hiring software now used by HR departments in most large organizations. A Harvard Business Review article from a couple years ago estimated that up to 72% of resumes are weeded out by an algorithm before a human ever sees them. Okay, that number isn't 72% today, I can tell you. Right? Higher. Much higher. There are considered, that was, that was basically at the sort of first wave of uh, these uh, uh, software packages being, being rolled out. Uh, so I guess it's probably at least 85% at this point. There are considerable social and economic advantages to hiring by algorithm. The best hiring algorithms, in theory, can promote a more diverse and well-qualified workforce, bypassing irrelevant factors that human evaluators commonly favor or disfavor, but that do not reliably correlate with candidate quality, such as Anglo-American or male-sounding names. Still, hiring algorithms can reflect, perpetuate, and even magnify harmful human biases embedded in their training data. Remember what I said before about the biases getting baked in even when you don't have certain categories labeled, right? Uh, so even if you strip the names out of the resumes, uh, there may still be other indicators of ethnic background, gender, uh, in the data that the system can pick up on. If, for example, a machine learning algorithm is trained on data about previous workers in a given industry, and it learns that male entry-level engineers in the training data set were promoted more quickly and more often, the algorithm might unreasonably favor male candidates for engineering jobs going forward. Unless specifically programmed to avoid that pitfall, the AI system built on that algorithm will not consider 
that the past data on promotion rates is likely to reflect historically ingrained but unjust social biases against women engineers. The same goes for past hiring biases based on economic class, region of origin, or prestige of university background. We know that these things are only weakly correlated with candidate performance in most fields, and yet humans and computers can seize upon them and overvalue them based on past practices where these things were uh, uh, given undue influence. Consider one popular service, HireVue, which uses opaque proprietary algorithms to analyze video interviews of job candidates and project traits of personality and fit with the company based on existing HR data. If a candidate is rejected by the system based on poor fit with the company norms, how confident can we be that this is related to a job relevant personality trait, such as quickness to anger or deceptiveness, as opposed to the algorithm's marking of an unusual muscle tick, a regional accent, culture specific facial expressions or gestures, body mass, external signs of age or disability, or race related dialect? Right? Remember, this is an algorithm not analyzing resumes, but analyzing taped video interviews. Okay? So it's picking up on all of this data that's coming off of the video. Okay, all of those qualities, uh, the, the muscle tick, the, the body mass, the external signs of age and disability, uh, uh, culture-specific uh, indicators, all of these are either unethical and or illegal reasons to discriminate against an otherwise well-qualified job candidate. And yet we have no way of knowing whether HireVue's algorithm discriminates on these bases. Someone might rightly note that human interviewers routinely discriminate on such bases, which is why the algorithm was designed in the first place. This is true. But at least we don't assume humans to be objective analysts, and we are able to ask them about their reasons. Many a search committee will hold a member's feet to the fire to explain the basis of their reflexive dislike or distrust of a candidate that other, others on the committee find highly qualified. And the committee can discount the member's judgment if they are unable to identify good reasons for supporting it. No such process of critical discourse can take place between a human hiring manager and the higher view algorithm. Imagine, for example, that Ophelia has applied to a large engineering firm that uses such a system to automate the screening and interviewing of job candidates. Now say that her application is rejected, despite the fact that a male friend with far less experience and weaker credentials got an interview. Who or what is responsible for the decision? How can she know? Who can she ask? The human HR rep? In a previous era, Ophelia would have known that this is the person who can give her an answer, and who owes her an answer. The rep might lie about their reasons, but regardless, there is a person accountable for the decision who can be reason-given. Yet in the present system, who does Ophelia hold accountable? The frontline HR rep will not be trained or empowered to re reproduce the specific calculations that cause the algorithm to exclude Ophelia. The algorithm itself will be proprietary, and assuming it was developed with deep learning and other opaque AI techniques, even the third-party software engineers uh, who implemented it may not know exactly how or why it works. So perhaps Ophelia was rejected because the algorithm is biased against women, in which case those who designed and trained the algorithm would be to blame. Or perhaps she was rejected because some combination of her answers was strongly correlated in the training data with cases of employee absenteeism or theft, in which case it was a legitimate decision potentially. Or perhaps Ophelia went to Boston College and there's a freak statistical cluster of BC grads in the data set who washed out of the job in their first year. You can imagine a thousand other possibilities. I, I went to BC, so I met self own there. If Ophelia doesn't know and the HR rep doesn't either, then we have all lost the space to reason about and thus hold the hiring decision system accountable for its outputs and social effects. The space of moral reasons is thus essential for reflecting upon, appealing, and holding ourselves and others accountable for personal and social choices. Yet this space also has an important forward-looking function, <clears throat> namely enabling and encouraging the use of moral imagination in considering and weighing alternative patterns of moral reasoning and judgment. To reason about my past moral choices is always to invite the moral counterfactual. What if I had done, chosen, said that instead? Often this begins in the discursive space of reason giving and reason commanding that takes place between the self and the inquiring others, or the self and its conscience, or the public and the public conscience. Why didn't you, why didn't we do this? Why don't you, why don't we, want or value that enough. 
To answer such questions, we often have to construct an alternative history in which different motivations, values, and thoughts would have led to a different decision. I, or we in the case of public reasoning, may determine that these alternative motivations and reasons are ultimately unacceptable or incoherent, and thus that I or we could not have and still would not do that other thing. But often moral learning and growth takes root in the space of moral imagination where I or we realize that other, better choices were available to us through other and better patterns of reasoning, feeling, and valuation. Here I or we may resolve next time to reason better and do better, to give more discerning sentences, to protect and serve our community more reliably, to hire more fairly, or to vote more responsibly. Yet as part of an AI-driven decision system in which the reasoning is the machine-automated and opaque part, reducing humans in the system to mere inputs and passive messengers or recipients of outputs, the critical space of moral reasons becomes constricted to the point of vanishing, and with it are lost possibilities for meaningful moral reflection, appeal, responsibility, and imagination. Okay, so what could we do differently? While it is often impossible to design predictive algorithms and other AI decision support systems to be maximally fair and accurate among, uh, all, across all criteria and contexts, many researchers have suggested ways to make their outcomes more accurate, reliable, and fair. From attending carefully to undesirable, if unintended, social effects that may need to be mitigated, such as disparate impact on protected classes, to shifting the burden of uncertainty from impacted groups to decision makers, in order to incentivize AI designers and users to seek out better and more relevant data with which to train the algorithms. Okay, so one of the answers to the opacity problem has been, we will engineer these systems and audit these systems um, and modify these systems to ensure fair outcomes. Okay, that's great, but the point of my talk is that that doesn't solve the problem I'm addressing here. It solves one problem, it solves the sort of utilitarian problem of hurting people uh, uh, for unjust reasons. Um, and I, I, I hope that we do, in fact, um, become uh, more vigilant about these systems, uh, audit their outputs more carefully, and uh, protect uh, those uh, who might otherwise be harmed by them. But that isn't enough. As useful as such recommendations may be, they do not address the broader social and ethical questions raised by algorithmic opacity in decision support systems, including the specific concern I've raised here with respect to the space for moral re of moral reasons. For even if designers and users can be incentivized to promote better, fairer social outcomes in the use of AI decision support systems, this might still be done without any concerted effort to make the systems themselves more transparent to users or the public or to foster personal and public engagement by human reasoners in decision processes of considerable moral and political gravity. Ethically informed design and use of AI-driven decision support systems will therefore require more than fair and accurate outcomes. It will require explicit social recognition of and attention to the intrinsic value of high-quality human engagement in moral and political thought and discourse. In practical terms, that means asking new questions of every ex every proposed expansion or new form or implementation of AI-driven decision support. Questions such as these. What existing processes of personal and public moral or political reasoning does this system constrain or duplicate? Right? Ask the question, what sort of reasoning uh, is this taking the place of? Secondly, what, if anything, necessitates or justifies these constraints or duplications? I want to be clear. My argument is not that these systems are always uh, unjustifiable or that the automation of human decision-making is always inappropriate. I'm perfectly happy to fly on airplanes that are 99% of the time running uh, by a computer, right? Um, and we have some good reasons uh, to think that that's... Uh, a, a better way to fly, uh, as long as we've got some adequate training in the, in the pilot so they can operate in that 1% reliably, as we, we saw, unfortunately, in that uh, crash at SFO a few years ago. You can't, you can't let the humans off the hook. But look, there are lots of systems uh, where humans aren't great decision makers, and we're not really getting any better, and we're not likely to get better. 
So uh, one area of application here we could talk about is um, autonomous driving, uh, autonomous vehicles. Okay. Um, they're not ready for prime time yet, no matter what you're hearing, right? Um, the Teslas keep hitting fire trucks, um, and uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of problems with getting this technology ready uh, to be on the road uh, safely. However, humans are terrible drivers. We are getting worse, not better. And there is, uh, no one has any good ideas for how to make humans uh, more, more responsible, attentive drivers. Also, the kind of reasoning you do while driving I would argue, is not that critical to your moral development as a human being. People who've never driven their whole lives are probably perfectly capable of being uh, excellent citizens, uh, uh, family uh, members, friends. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that there's a compelling argument, right, that if we had autonomous cars that were safer than, uh, than humans, uh, that we should avoid using them because they take away some human uh, uh, performance. Okay? So the reason why this is important is we have to ask the question. We can't assume that it's justified or unjustified. We have to ask, is there a justification for uh, duplicating and replacing uh, this uh, human uh, judgment? And then we have to ask if, uh, uh, for example, uh, it is an, if it is an important kind of decision, like uh, judicial decisions or uh, political decisions, uh, can uh, the automated part be designed or used to in integrate rather than constrain the space for human moral reasoning, right? Is there a way to allow uh, the system uh, to leave room for it or even require uh, inputs from humans that require those humans to reason? And if so, where and how can this be done and with what additional resources? But notice this only works if you independently value the human reasoning. If you, if you think it's important. Otherwise, why would you spend the extra time and money to put it into this system, right? You would just build a system not to require humans because that's how you get uh, the cheaper, uh, uh, faster uh, output. Uh, so we have to independently recognize the value of human reasoning when it is important uh, and then figure out how we can integrate it uh, within our uh, computational systems. There's also the prospect of using the computational power of... Uh, artificial intelligent decision systems to make additional space for moral reasoning, perhaps by building into software uh, or institutional decision procedures discrete stages for human reasoning about the moral and political implications of the algorithm's inputs, outputs, and effects, or better yet, about the weightings and design uh, of the algorithm itself. Um, so there are lots of decisions, uh, hiring decisions, I gave an example of, that humans, again, are, are kind of bad at. Um, we, we don't uh, value the right uh, qualities. We uh, overvalue um, uh, certain qualities and undervalue others. Um, and because that is woven into a fabric of social biases that um, are often implicit, that we're not conscious of, it's very difficult to uh, uproot. So we often do make gut kinds of evaluations when we uh, are engaged in some sort of uh, hiring context or something like that um, that don't serve us very well. So we could have systems uh, that could actually help us reason better. Systems uh, that could require us to actually justify decisions uh, based on relevant criteria, right? Systems that could point out that we seem to have, for example, uh, pushed a resume to the bottom of the pile that is objectively uh, uh, superior to uh, the ones on the top of the pile. And the system could say, hey, uh, this uh, person uh, with a non-Anglo-American sounding name seems to be clearly the top candidate, but you've ranked them uh, uh, nine of 10. Uh, why is that? Um, so machines could actually help us to reason better if we cared enough about our own reasoning uh, to build systems to do that. Let me back up just a second. Okay, so this is my concluding remarks. Asimov's multivax scenario may not be in our immediate electoral future, but very close cousins of it are already taking shape in many other areas of personal and public decision making about morally and politically significant matters of health, justice, labor, finance, education, family, and community life. In more and more of these domains, the personal and public space of moral reasons is contracting as the power and socioeconomic utility of sophisticated machine algorithms expands. The space of moral reasons 
has been constrained before, and in other ways, of course. It's been constrained by priests, by kings, by oligarchs and family elders who would gladly substitute their moral and political judgments for ours, and by bureaucrats who endlessly invent and have for centuries analog means of rendering such judgments opaque. But at the heart of the modern enlightenment lies Immanuel's, Immanuel Kant's urgent call to dare to think for ourselves, a call answered in part by the rise of modern public education and liberal democracies that sought to expand the space of moral reasons and its privileges to the greater share of humanity. Today we risk surrendering that inheritance to algorithms embedded in helpful AI agents that unlike tyrants and oligarchs appear to us not as self-interested oppressors but as benign and neutral servants of our will. Yet in closing up the space of moral reasons by making human operations in that space seem increasingly superfluous, inefficient, and unreliable, their impact on the moral and political maturity of humanity may be no less retrograde. Fortunately, this future is not yet set for us. Those who would fight to protect and expand the space of moral reasons have a long history of resistance to learn from, and those who came before us would tell us that the prize has always been worth fighting for. Thank you. Yeah. No, this is actually a conversation that's been happening uh, for about five years um, in my field. Uh, so let me just say a couple things about this. Um, so first of all, uh, if anyone tells you um, that uh, you know Siri or Alexa. Uh, understands your emotions, um, uh, or is emotionally intelligent. There's a robot, uh, Japanese robot called Pepper, uh, that was advertised as the first emotionally the first emotional robot. It's all a lie, um, <laughs> absolutely a lie. Um, these systems, however, the reason it can appear to be true is because they can uh, pick up on statistical correlations in human emotional expression and manipulate that. Right? Uh, so understanding emotion and being able to uh, detect it and use it are two very different things. So these systems do not have emotion and they do not understand. For them, emotion is no different than any other statistical signal. It's just another number in the matrix. That's it. Okay? But to you, it may appear that it has an emotional response to your emotions, and that is a very powerful and dangerous illusion that these systems will have. <laughs> And because we anthropomorphize, I mean, I, I get mad at my computer. I, I anthropomorphize everything in my house and think it, you know, it, it, it's trying to frustrate me or, you know. And so this is, and humans have, I mean, we, there are psychological experiments in which humans will anthropomorphize a, a, like a garbage can. Um, there's a, a Stanford researcher, uh, Wendy Ju, who does this wonderful research where she just puts a garbage can on a little trolley and steers it with a remote control and she can get people to think that the garbage can wants you to throw trash in it. Okay, and there's no face on it, there's no voice. We, so the point is, it's so easy to manipulate humans because we're wired by evolution to interpret things through the lens of emotion, to interpret uh, uh, things, to humanize things. Uh, and so we will do it with these machines with very few cues, and, uh, and that's a powerful uh, danger for us. So we have to just explicitly remember Again, that these systems have no emotional intelligence whatsoever, um, but they have proxies for it that can be very deceptive. A uh, second thing I want to say is the logic thing. Um, computer scientists in the 80s were developing artificial intelligence primarily through sort of logical systems that represented knowledge in ways that we would kind of, ref kind of understand as analogs to logical reasoning. Um, and encoding logical structures into the systems. One thing that's important to, to realize is that many of the AI systems that are being developed today are in fact not based on those kind of formal logical operations. They are statistical. And so often, so, so you know, a, a lot of the talk is, oh, well, these machines are logical. Well, isn't being logical great? Like, we love Spock. We, we think Spock could, could govern our decisions pretty well most of the time. Like, maybe there are things that Spock gets wrong because of the lack of emotion, right? But these machi machines aren't Spock. These machines aren't reasoning even by logical standards. They're discovering statistical correlations and manipulating them. 
Um, and it's just numbers in a matrix. There's no meaning. There's no sense. There's no logic in the sense that a human understands the word logic. It's a very different kind of logic. Yeah. And then the third thing I want to say is about adding emotion to the machines. Um, this is a, a really controversial point because absolutely, people like myself believe that emotions help us reason better. Uh, when we use, when we manage our emotions and integrate them with our reasoning, right? Um, so the idea is, well, maybe that if we did have truly intelligent machines, we would need them to have emotional intelligence because otherwise they would be, at best, Spock, right? And they'd miss those sort of emotionally uh, laden decisions. Um, so on the other hand, the immense danger, right, of trying to build a system that genuinely does have emotional intelligence and figuring out how we would even do that when we know very little about how human emotion is encoded in the brain. Um, these are really challenging problems, but, but the great, great comments. How, does that, how would that relate to artificial intelligence? So I think that AI that we have today, um, uh, there, there's no ego, there's no self, there's no consciousness, there's no awareness. Again, it's just math, it's just math being manipulated um, within a, a physical system and the behavior can seem intelligent it can seem so when you have Alexa in your house and you know Alexa is having a conversation with you and it feels for a moment like Alexa is sort of present there that's a very powerful psychological illusion and I'm not saying it's necessarily a bad thing as long as you know that it's an illusion and you're not sort of confused and Alexa's not good enough or smart enough in that sort of uh, illus illusory sense to really fool you for very long, right? Although I do worry about children and their uh, ability to uh, discern the distinction between uh, what are essentially very, very fancy parlor tricks of computer science right now and real presence of a person to us. So again, we're very far away from that moment where our machines are truly uh, our friends, our companions. Unfortunately, we're not far away uh, in fact, we're already here at the moment where they will be sold to us as those things. Uh, so I think it's more and more. That's why people are so upset about Google Duplex, which was demoed as a, a way of making uh, an artificially intelligent virtual assistant seem more human. And so when it calls to make a hair appointment for you, it will say, so um, I'd like to make a hair appointment for, and so with the ums and the uptalk and the like, so that the person on the other end will think wow. they're talking to a human. Wow. Well. Google seemed to have no idea that this would upset people, which is its own red flag, right? That this wasn't flagged, um, even as Google was talking about being more responsible. Um, and the reason it upsets people is because we're already at risk of uh, losing clarity about what machines are and what they're not. Mm -hmm. And the more that manipulation and deception is built into the systems, uh, the, the more uh, harm uh, will be done and the more we will be at risk. I mean, the fortunate thing is that there's thousands of years of things to base it on, thousands of years of philosophical uh, thinking about what kinds of political judgments are justified and by what reasons, what kinds of moral judgments are justified and by what reasons. Um, if you look at the um, uh, traditions outside of uh, the uh, Western European tradition, uh, there's an equally rich discourse about what kinds of reasons and what kinds of considerations uh, can be justified. And so, I mean, this is not just my own uh, uh, particular professional interest, but the education of a philosophical culture is largely what pushes back against uh, these kinds of uh, pseudo justifications, right? Where uh, we don't have reasons that can actually hold up to scrutiny. Uh, we have reasons that will shut people up and uh, and say, "Oh, I can't." You you mentioned capitalism, so I can't I can't fight with you now because then I'll look like a communist, and we know that makes me or a socialist. That makes me bad, right? So a lot of the reasons we use to justify our uh, choices are just meant to shut down debate and discourse, uh, not to open it up, uh, and. Philosophy is, when you take a philosophy course in college, the first thing you learn is that you're not allowed to get away with that kind of thing, right? The professor shuts you down immediately and says, uh, no, you just appealed to emotion, or that was an ad hominem fallacy. You, you attack the person and not, uh, or their ideology and not their reasons. Um, and you, uh, you very quickly learn what it means uh, to, to reason uh, properly. And the Enlightenment was kind of all about this dream that humans could move forward uh, into uh, 
this not being the province of an intellectual elite, uh, but something that we could teach all of our children uh, to learn to do, uh, to be uh, fuller uh, participants in uh, their societies, uh, to, to be citizens. And one of the things I think we lost in this country is uh, in the post-war period, uh, we went from a model of public education in which public education was seen as the jewel of uh, American life, the thing that would drive us forward, and also something that taught not only facts, but also taught civic values and, and, and taught about sort of the, the meaning of democracy and the meaning of citizenship as a moral and political concept. We, we dumped that uh, in the 70s and 80s, and we went to a much narrower vision of what public education would be. We dropped everything out of it that was value-laden. Um, we made it all about uh, memorization and recitation of uh, facts and data. We made ourselves into, we made our students into computers um, to, to basically be, uh, to spit out the right outputs uh, from the inputs that we gave them. Um, and then we, and then we defunded the whole thing. Right? And now we wonder why we have a, a society in which people don't reason well. So, so I think we know what part of the fix is. We, we have to go back to the things that we once did well because we knew they matter. The problem is those, those things also made people more free. And they, and they made people more active citizens. And there are lots of interests in this country uh, that are not interested in having more active free citizens. So we have to push back. So maybe we'll No, I mean, you can actually just Google trolley problem and driverless cars, and there's about 40 media articles about what this is going to do. Right now, the technology doesn't allow us to, uh, uh, to make those kinds of uh, considerations from the machine standpoint, because the machine can't tell the difference between a trash can and a toddler, um, but one, which is a problem. Uh, well, I mean, look at the case in Arizona. The, the, plas uh, the person walked into the street, and the uh, car saw the person and didn't stop because it uh, judged that it was a, likely to be a false positive. Um, and the car was tuned to not have too many false positives, so it's not stopping all the time when it doesn't need to be. Uh, so it literally couldn't tell the difference between a, a person and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a ghost image or a trash bag or who knows what. Uh, so um, we may get to that point where our cars have to make ethical decisions. Uh, or we have to pre-program ethical uh, value-laden evaluations uh, into, the, into the cars. Um, so you're right, that, that may be uh, in the future. It's not here today. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Thank Shana Thank you so much.